I got an email about two months ago from TEDxGSU letting me know that I'd been nominated to give a talk and wondering if I was interested. I considered it a huge honor, so as soon as I got the email, I was thrilled. I screenshotted it, sent it to my mom, my aunt, my advisor, my dog sitter. I even showed it to my dog. The two of us did a little happy dance. We were really, really excited. And then, within a matter of a few minutes, I became completely consumed by dread, fear, panic, anxiety. What the heck am I going to talk about? Are people going to care about what I have to say? Does what I have to say even matter? So, almost immediately after I sent that first screenshot, I sent a follow-up text to my mom, my aunt, my advisor, my friends, my dog sitter, saying, yeah, I'm not sure I'm going to do it. The end of that story is that I'm here, I'm doing it, and I'm going to use this opportunity to talk about anxiety. Specifically, I'm going to talk about social anxiety. Social anxiety is an intense fear or anxiety about being in situations where you might be evaluated. So that can include having a conversation, meeting new people, being observed like during a performance, and public speaking. Um, and this social anxiety exists on a spectrum from extreme anxiety when in social situations that is often endured with intense discomfort and often even just avoided altogether to, on the low end, very little worry when you're in social situations. At that extreme end, we call it social anxiety disorder. But in reality, everyone experiences at least some level of social anxiety in their lives. For example, by a quick show of hands, how many of you feel like you've had a fear of public speaking at some point in your lives? Okay, so it looks like most, if not all, of the room. And that's pretty consistent. The research sort of suggests that close to 75% of the total population, maybe more, maybe less, experience very intense anxiety during, giving, or during a public uh, talk. So if nothing else, at least the talk is somewhat relevant to most, if not all of you. Today, I'm going to be talking about three key aspects of social anxiety that I study in my research and that I work on with some of my patients. These three aspects fall under the umbrella term cognitive biases. And cognitive biases are a psychologist's technical way of saying thought traps. They're ways of thinking that maintain our anxiety. So I'm going to talk to you about three thought traps, but before I do that, I'm going to tell you a story, or I'm going to read you a story, rather, and I'm going to have you try and remember it because I'm going to come back to it later. Okay? All right, here's a story. Sally is a junior in college, and she's taking a history class this semester. One of her final assignments is to give a talk on the history of something, anything. She chooses to talk about the history of psychology. After the talk, she receives feedback from her professor and her peers. Her professor said that she did an excellent job and that the content was well thought out. One of her peers commended her topic choice. Another said that she was a strong speaker, but that she spoke slightly fast. Two of her friends noted that she appeared confident and intelligent. OK, so that's the end of the story. I want you to try and keep it up there. I'm going to come back to it later. There are no surprises here. All right, let's talk about thought trap number one. Imagine you're me. You're up here, you're giving this talk, and you tell a joke. It's a good joke. People seem to like the joke. They're all laughing, right? They all seem pretty happy. How many of you saw this face first, as soon as the screen came up? A few of you, OK. How many of you saw this face first? A few more. What about this guy back here? Most of you, OK. I personally like this guy. He just you know, is having a great time. He's loving it. Well, someone with social anxiety may not necessarily see all those happy faces first. Someone who's experiencing anxiety while they're giving this talk might actually see this face first. You're not really sure what she's thinking. She's definitely giving you the stink eye. I think you might have offended her and maybe even her family. The entire talk is ruined. Get off the stage. It's all falling apart. We call this an attention bias. It's the tendency for someone who's experiencing social anxiety to pay immediate attention to things that seem scary or threatening or negative. But the research is slightly more nuanced than that. 
not only do people who are experiencing social anxiety pay more immediate attention to the faces like that that are kind of scary, they also tend to avoid them more. So I might see this face and start thinking about how lousy I am at a speaker, as, a, as a speaker and how badly the talk is going and then choose to replace it with a picture of my cute dog or just avoid it altogether by looking away. All right, so that's our first thought trap, attention bias. Let's talk about our second one. And to talk about this one, I'm going to use the help of Lindsey Graham. What if I told you that within the first four seconds after this picture came up, all of you showed a physiological response that you're probably not aware of? Your pupils dilated. Now you might be familiar with the concept that your pupils dilate when you're in a dark room and they constrict when you're in a well-lit room, kind of like this. But light isn't the only stimulus that your pupils respond to. In fact, decades of research has shown that your pupil dilates or increases in size when you see things that evoke strong feelings, like this angry Lindsey Graham face. So that's interesting, but why is it important? Why should we care? Well, what if the size of your pupil could tell us if you're at risk of developing anxiety or depression? Research has shown consistently that people with schizophrenia show a smaller pupil diameter when doing really challenging tasks. Research has also shown that people with depression show a larger pupil diameter when they look at sad faces. And Children of mothers with depression who show a larger pupil diameter in response to sad faces also show an earlier onset of depression. But with anxiety, the research is a lot more mixed, and that's where some of my work comes in. In a college sample, so you guys, I looked at the relationship between self-reported social anxiety and pupil diameter in response to faces that ranged in intensity from high angry, like this, to low angry, to low happy, to high happy. Here's what I found. Regardless of level of social anxiety, everyone showed the largest pupil diameter when they looked at faces like this. And that's probably because faces like this signal threat. So that makes sense, right? But what was more interesting was people who reported higher social anxiety showed a smaller pupil diameter when they looked at faces that were more ambiguous or uncertain, like this. And that's probably what we think is happening here, is that when these people who are socially anxious see faces like this that may or may not signal threat, they start to worry about that, and then they shut down. And that results in smaller pupil diameter. Again, the research here is more nuanced than that. Not only do people who show, are, um, who show smaller pupil diameters in response to these faces um, experience higher social anxiety, they also tend to spend less time looking at faces like this. So they're avoiding it. They look at the face, worry about whether or not it's threatening, and then choose to replace it with a picture of my dog, or just look away from it altogether. We call this an interpretation bias. It's the tendency for someone with social anxiety to interpret uncertain or more ambiguous cues as threatening or scary. All right, so we have our first two biases, attention bias, interpretation bias, which brings us to our last one. That story I read you, we're coming back to it right now. We're going to play a game. Quick show of hands. Her professor told her that she did a blank job. How many of you think it's A, OK? How many of you think it's B, good? Got a few hands. Ooh, got, got quite a few hands, OK. C, great. Many more hands. D, excellent. OK, so we're pretty evenly spread across good, great, and excellent. Lovely. OK, here's the next question. Another peer said that she was a strong speaker, but that she spoke blank fast. How many of you think it's A, slightly? Several hands, OK. B, very. Quite a few, OK. And then C, too fast. Many, many hands, OK. And D, terribly. No one. No one thinks it was terribly fast. OK. All right. Keep that in mind. The next question. Which of these statements is true? Sally was unprepared. No one. Sally appeared confident. Most of you. Sally's topic choice was confusing. One, OK. Sally dressed professionally. Few hands, OK. Ready for your answers? 
Answer to number one was D, excellent. A lot of you thought it was good, thought it was great, not excellent, right? Answer to number two, A, slightly. If I recall, most of you thought that she spoke too fast. Answer to number three, which most of you got correct, Sally appeared confident. All right. We call this one a memory bias. It's the tendency for someone experiencing social anxiety to remember things as being a lot worse than it actually was. A lot of times, people with social anxiety really only remember the negative things. But more often than not, they just remember the positive things as being less positive than it actually was. So she was an excellent speaker, not just a great speaker. They also remember the negative things as being a lot negative than it actually was. She spoke only slightly fast, not too fast. All right, so we have our three biases. Attention bias, interpretation bias, memory bias. But what's next? Where do we go from here? Are we done? Are we just going to keep falling into these traps over and over again? Is there no hope? This would be pretty lousy if I just ended here and was like, yeah, you're all doomed. <laughs> but that's not true. We know that these patterns can change. And this is what I work on with some of my patients. We know that the first step is awareness. You're now all aware of at least three traps that we can fall into when we're feeling anxious. The second step is insight. Ask yourselves, why do we fall into these traps to begin with? What do I think about my ability as a speaker that makes these traps stick? The third step is behavior change or practice. Can we practice catching ourselves when we're falling into these traps? Can we practice alternate thoughts to, I'm a lousy speaker, or I'm no good at making friends? Can we practice saying yes, even when our fear really makes us want to say no? We know that through awareness, insight, and practice, we can change these patterns. We also know that therapy works. Psychotherapy is incredibly effective for people experiencing a range of mental illnesses, including anxiety and depression. Which brings me to my last point. Just as when we are scared, we avoid looking at those scary faces, and just as when we're feeling anxious, we avoid the uncertain faces, in our society, we have a tendency to avoid talking about mental health and mental illness probably because those topics are scary and uncertain. But that has to change. We have to start talking about the normalcy of seeing a therapist. Seeing a therapist for your anxiety or your depression should be as easy as going to a doctor when you have a cold. It should be widely accepted, and in fact, it should be encouraged. My therapy today was talking to about 250 of you, probably more because of YouTube, about anxiety. I'm going to leave you with this. When I finish or end my therapy sessions with my patients, I always give them some home practice to work on before our next session. So here's yours. When you go home tonight, I want each of you to think about what thought traps you fall into that make talking about mental health difficult. Because together, we have to stop avoiding and start talking about mental health. Thank you.